When you hear that music, you know that military historian, U.S. Army veteran, and award-winning author Mike Gordia is back on Big Blend Radio. And today he's joining us to talk about war crimes and spies during World War II. Cool. Wow. I couldn't believe, like, this list of people. Like, you know, Julia Child, what was she doing? I don't know. I don't know. Maybe she's cooking for people. I don't Maybe. know. But I'm sure he's going to tell us. Mike is the author of over ten books, including Hal Moore, A Soldier Once and Always, American Gorilla, The Forgotten Heroics of Russell W. Volkman, Shadow Commander, the epic story of Donald D. Blackburn, The Fires of Babylon Eagle Troop, and The Battle of 73 Easting, Hal Moore on Leadership, Winning When Outgunned and Outnumbered, and Crusader, General Don Starry, and Army of His Times, and the Army of His Times. His latest book is Hal Moore, A Life in Pictures. Of course, you can get them all on Amazon, but we say go to his website, too, MikeGuardia.com. He's also an expert on BlendRadioAndTV.com, and he sent us on a, spa, a Mission Possible story series across the country as part of our Love Your Parks tour, where we are following in the general's footsteps, not just the generals he's written about, but we're finding all kinds of connections with generals everywhere we go, like we are here in Yuma, Arizona today. Uh, Military Mike, welcome back. How are you? Hey, Lisa. Hey, Nancy. It's great to be on the show, as always. Yeah, it's good to have you back here. Uh, Yuma, Arizona, Nancy and I were just saying, we think you need to come spend a week with us here because this is like a military hub of big tanks and uh, air history, like, you know, Amelia Earhart came through here. Mm -hmm. The very first Mm -hmm. airplane landed here. Uh, So a lot of aviation and... um, and big tanks. There's big tanks everywhere. There's the proving ground. The proving ground, yeah. Mm-hmm. So the proving ground, Military Mike, is that's really where, like, is it the same like when we were in 29 Palms, they were out there blowing things up? Is it kind of like the test area to, to learn maneuvers? Pretty much. Hmm. Okay. Yeah, cool. Pr- pretty Blowing much. Anytime the, Army, uh, yeah, anytime the Army names a place a proving ground, uh, it's, a military base that exists only for the purpose of testing that equipment. You know, they want to uh, see if this experimental vehicle or this experimental weapon system of some sort will do what it's supposed to do and uh, try and do it under, um, try and do it under as uh, many ideal field conditions as they can. Mm. And then having, you know, being in Yuma, does it help because of the, you know, we are the sunniest place on Earth. I mean, I, they were even looking at Yuma for uh, space travel, you know, and things like that. I know Elon Musk comes out here quite a bit, too. Um, so is it because mm-hmm. of the desert environment and having clear skies? Oh, yeah. All that mm-hmm. environmental stuff. I mean, that certainly helps. Mm-hmm. Okay. So now war crimes. Um, you know, because yes. normally we're talking about your generals. Now, I hear that mm-hmm. Russell Volkman um, – now he wasn't a spy, but he no. he was connected <laughs> to a spy. Indeed, he was. Yeah. So uh, the story of Russell Volkman uh, actually begins in the Philippines. If we wind the clocks back to 1941, uh, here we are. We're on the verge of entering World War II, and uh, everyone is quite certain that if the Japanese are going to strike first, uh, it's probably not going to be the Philippines and you know everyone's everyone's a little on edge but when the Japanese do come to the Philippines nobody anticipates uh, as quick of a collapse of the American defenses as what ultimately played out of course we all know that uh, that the American and Philippine forces got pushed all the way to Bataan where they ultimately surrendered and uh, surrendered not by choice they were given the order to but among those who surrendered to the Japanese, uh, there was a gentleman by the name of Russell Volkman. He was a young captain at the time who, who refused the order to surrender. Uh, he said, I know what the Japanese do to prisoners of war. I know the atrocities that they're capable of. Uh, if we saw it in Manchuria, and if Manchuria was any indication of how they're going to treat the people that they conquer, uh, yeah, I'll take my chances in the jungle before I rely on the good graces of a Japanese POW camp. So what he does is he disappears into the jungle, and for the next three years he wages a guerrilla war against the Japanese occupation force. And what really makes him thrive is that he, uh, is he learns the art of guerrilla warfare on the fly, and he makes a, uh, he makes a vast and, and extensive use of a network of spies. 
because the heavy-handed occupation uh, tactics and techniques of the Japanese uh, certainly weren't winning them a lot of friends among the local population. Uh, so he organized a network of spies that numbered into the tens of thousands and uh, had them spy on Japanese uh, on, on uh, a lot of Japanese garrisons, wow. had them spy on supply depots, uh, feed him all of the necessary intelligence he needed that he needed in order to wear down the Japanese war machine and make it that much easier for the allies to come back and retake the Philippines. Wow. He was rogue, man. I mean, he That's really was. Cool. It was it, it's interesting about his story and also uh, Donald D. Blackburn and that because um, – and even Al Moore, too, right, that they kind of changed the way the military thought and operated when things like this happened where it, we're going to have to go beyond what we were taught right. to make things work. You know, mm-hmm. so that's- exactly. He uh, he was an innovator who really had to think on his feet because his life depended on it. Mm, exactly. And how are the communications? I mean, it, when you think that far back without internet, you know, it's like how. I mean, maybe you were just kind of left to your own devices in some areas, just because no one could get messages through, possibly. Right. Well, it, it it was pretty sophisticated for its time. Um, mm-hmm. What he did was he ended up using a system of relay messengers, and uh, he would establish uh, he he would establish these messenger routes all throughout mm-hmm. northern Luzon, and uh, he would make sure that no messenger took the same route twice. Uh, he had it mapped out as uh, as really a wow. series of spider trails that uh, spread from one coast to another. And at each relay station, uh, the person who was on the receiving end would have to receive a certain code word or a certain signal to know that it was a friendly messenger and not someone that, and not someone who had been compromised by the Japanese. So his uh, so his system of relay messaging worked pretty well for the first two years that he was conducting the guerrilla war. And uh, while he was doing that, he was able to uh, he was able to take over. Um, the abandoned office of a sawmill company and use the Morse code system and use that to establish contact with other allied units that were, that were beyond the Philippines. And uh, using the, uh, using that radio contact, he was able to uh, establish comms with MacArthur's headquarters in Australia. Wow. Whoa. Whoa. Yeah. Cool. Dude. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> <impressive>. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Running around. So he Dude. found a way to make it work. <laughs> yeah, well, it's creative. That's a, it, and that's yeah. really part of it. I mean, is that creativity of how how are you going to make this work? You know, once you're out in the field, you're going to have to do something different. You know, I know we've talked about this on the show with you before, but like, that's what was so fascinating about Shaka Zulu, of how he, I mean, how he changed how they fought and how they took the British down and how they, you know, circled them and. You know, it wasn't what they expected. It's the same thing as when we were talking about the Battle of Orleans, you know, when, Mm -hmm. you know, how Andrew Jackson got that. I mean, how he fought that and made it, you know, I don't know if somebody else could have taken over his position to make that work, you know, to win that battle. I think it's a, yeah, it's it's a perfect example of the right person being in the right place at the right time. Mm hmm. And using, using everything you have. Yeah. It's got to outsmart. Yeah. Yeah. That's interesting. So now, okay, so Russell Volkman, everyone, again, uh, you know, Mike has written about him, American Gorilla, see, <laughs> the forgotten heroics of Russell W. Volkman. Uh, re- refresh our memories on that, of how you found out about uh, Volkman. Well, let's see. Uh, I had picked up a two-volume set a uh, long time ago. This was it's probably around 2006. It was a uh, it was a uh, two-volume set called War in the Shadows, and it was a uh, history of guerrilla warfare from biblical times up until about 1977. And uh, it, was, it, was, it was just this two-volume set oh. that I picked up at a rummage sale. And, uh, you know, I was thumbing through it, and, uh, you know, I, I, of course, found a lot of instances of guerrilla warfare that I was familiar with. Um, but then... I noticed um, towards the end of the series, there was this chapter called Allied Resistance Movements in the Philippines. And I was kind of taken aback because, you know, everything in my historical education to that point hadn't mentioned anything about there being any type of guerrilla movement in the Philippines. I mean, all I knew practically was that um, 
In early 1942, Bataan fell to the Japanese. MacArthur got on a speedboat to Australia and said, I shall return. And then three years later, he came back, and the Allies retook the Philippines, and that was it. And there was pretty much nothing that happened in between. But as I was digging into it, you know, they told me about some of the indigenous guerrilla movements, and then there were only about two paragraphs of this guy that I had never heard of before. His name was Russell Volkman, and he commanded a guerrilla army, like raised a guerrilla army from the ground floor up against the Japanese. Wow. I'm thinking to myself, wow, how did I never hear about this? I started floating yeah. his name to some other historians, and they hadn't heard of him either. So uh, I went about trying to uh, find any of his relatives that were still alive. Maybe I could get some information on this guy because, uh, you know, at the time uh, – I was this young 20-something college student, and I thought it would really make a, a good master's thesis or maybe a paper to write. Uh, so I found I found uh, all three of his sons, all all three of whom were still living, and uh, I even found uh, <laughs> I even found his widow, who was also still alive. And uh, wow. you know they they pretty much just opened the floodgates of all the information that they had of him, and uh, I found out something even more peculiar. Aside from what he did in the Philippines, that he was one of the founding fathers of the Army Special Forces, and you know, yet he remained hmm. largely forgotten by history. Hmm. Wow. So, okay, when you're doing this kind of research and when you start digging in, since you're on a family history show, our third Friday family history show, um, do you do like family trees and do you dig into records and kind of – trace all the family members and, and become that kind of researcher? Well, I haven't done any genealogies per se, uh, but I have uh, constructed parts of a family tree um, as a matter of course when I'm doing the research for any one of my projects. And uh, it, it's, it's, it's always pretty fascinating to find out who's related to who. And, uh, uh, as as a matter of fact, that was one way that I found out that Hal Moore had uh, quite a big military presence. You know, his uh, well, his his family lineage had, had a big military presence going all the way back to Virginia in like the 1600s, and he even had uh, he had uh, had blood relatives who had fought in the Civil War. Wow, that's crazy! I know. <laughs> when you start looking at it, you start wow. tracing people's family, and it's. It, it is, you know, how many people find out they're, you know, related to Washington or something, and it's like, wow, right. <laughs> you know, the, the father of America, I'm related to him in some way, you know, how it all trickles right. down. Eventually, we'll find out we're all connected, right? So it's, mm -hmm. it's interesting when you start to dig in. Do you look at things like prison records and census records, or are you going mostly through military records when you do your research? Uh, mostly through military records. I've, I've referenced mm -hmm. a census report or two. And, um, yeah, but, but most of what I have comes from either family records or military records. Hmm. That's interesting, yeah, because mm -hmm. military is going to be pretty straight up. You know what I mean? It's different than sometimes you go to a newspaper, mm -hmm. start reading newspaper yeah, reports, and, be... and newspapers can do what they want. <laughs> yeah, they can send you way off on mm -hmm. the wild goose chase. It's just like, you know, Benjamin Franklin's yeah. album next. You uh -huh. know, yeah. he wrote what he wanted. He wanted to entertain people. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Mm -hmm. Right. With yeah. a is a probably way different between yeah. military records and yeah that's it's fascinating a friend of ours um bob wilson robert michael wilson mm -hmm. he is a mm -hmm. uh, retired sheriff from la and um he's you know he went out and started tracing all the crimes of the west the wild west the stage and the hanging the stagecoach and... robberies and he found out that half the newspaper reports were wrong and he yeah. would actually like go to the place and look at, you know, what would have happened where, and he's had entire towns, like, freak out about him. He goes, <laughs> like, Wickenburg, Arizona, yes. there was a massacre, and he'd go in and say, so-and-so did, he'd walk in a restaurant and say, the Mexicans did it, and everybody will freak out, or, hey, it was the Indians, and everybody will freak out, because everyone believes, and they're still fighting over it to this day, who started the massacre, yeah. and uh, he got hooked into it, and he's just gone into... I mean, there's some brutal stuff that has happened in this country. I mean, everywhere. And I think World War II, we saw some crazy things happen. Well, not us personally, but there were some really brutal things that happened, especially if you were a prisoner of war. Mm -hmm. Were there laws back then? Because, you know, I've heard and read stories about, you know, American prisoners of war 
and then like the Japanese would put like bamboo shoots under their fingernails and mm -hmm. drip water on their oh, heads yeah. and stuff like that. Is that stuff true, or mm -hmm. am I watching movies <laughs> and I get this wrong? Uh, no, sadly, sadly that is true. And uh, even more sad is that that's not even the worst of it, really. Um, you know, uh, in some of the uh, some of the conversations that I had with Blackburn's family, and uh, what ended up in a lot of Blackburn's personal papers, were some of the more horrific things that they were that were some of the more horrific things that the Japanese were doing to Americans. And uh, you know, a lot of these were echoed by survivors of the Bataan Death March. Just mm -hmm. to give you uh, probably what's uh, and. It's a little bit – it would make you a little squeamish to talk about this, but just to give you a representative example of some of what was on the upper end of the spectrum of what they were doing, um, one, of the, uh, one of the Japanese's um, weapons of choice was the bayonet, and they were particularly creative with uh, how they would uh -oh. use the bayonet um, okay. against <laughs> Americans or even against people on the Chinese mainland. Uh, one example that I found out from Blackburn about what they would do is uh, they would take the edge of a bayonet that was still attached to a rifle, and they would put it underneath the eyelid of an American soldier, oh, where, no. where they would tuck it inside. Yeah, they would tuck it inside the eyelid, and then they would Dude. let go. Well, you know, gravity does all the work you know, to mm. to where to to where the rifle becomes the lever, and the point of the bayonet becomes the fulcrum, and then out pops that guy's eye. Oh, no, Nancy's no, totally freaking no. out. She's totally grossed out, man. No, <laughs> no but that is gross. Right. I mean, it's it that that's, is that's that is disgusting. That is gross. So now, yeah. would that be labeled as a war crime internationally, or was it just everybody had a piece of each other at that point? Like with those kind of hor horrific things. I mean, would that be labeled as? I mean, the Holocaust. That there was some. That was war crimes, right? But when it comes to right. I mean, there's genocides. Even look at Rwanda, right? Look what happened in Rwanda. Mm -hmm. They were just, oh, no, the, God, the Rwanda was yeah. terrible. Um, right. And we're still having that happen in countries right now, you know? Um, but mm -hmm. Isn't this why we ended up with the Geneva Convention? Wasn't that? Absolutely. Brought into, yeah, so that even mm -hmm. you may be at war, but the, the war crimes, you, I don't know what happens if you can try a country for war crimes under the Geneva Convention. I mean, what? The, yes. What do you? <laughs> you can, but then mm -hmm. what? Do you, you're not putting the whole country in jail. Yeah. Yeah. So how? Well, I no, mean. No. Well, it, hmm. after World War II, the Geneva Convention was really a consolidated effort to try to make the militaries and governments of all, all of the world's nations accountable for any of the really bad things that they did during wartime. Now, mm -hmm. before the Geneva Conventions, there were some international laws on the books, but you know they were pretty fluid, and uh, to a great extent, not a lot of them were truly enforceable. Uh, you know, it was the long-standing—I mean, it was the long-standing notion of hey, every country, every country has its own sovereignty; they can pretty much do what they want. You're only really bound by treaties and contracts that you make with other nations. Um, so, international law, as it was at that point, was still kind of in its infancy and mm -hmm. you know people would also say okay well war by its very nature by its very nature is supposed to be brutal i mean yeah there are established uh you know unwritten rules of conduct and you know gentlemen are supposed to fight a certain way but you know you could have a country in europe that goes to war with a country in asia they come from two different mm -hmm. cultures and they may not see eye to eye on what exactly is acceptable conduct and warfare so after all of the atrocities of World War II came to light, you know, not the least of which was the Holocaust, that's when, mm. you know, that's when a lot of the, uh, that's when a lot of the post-industrial world came together and said, well, okay, uh, let's have some type of international convention that makes sure that things this bad don't happen again. So we'll have right. the UN on one hand that will, you know, try and de-escalate conflicts before they go to war, but if diplomacy fails, well. Hey, let's have this uh, roundabout set of laws that says, okay, you can kill, but you know, if you go into a town and just start mowing down civilians, well, that in and of itself is a war crime. You can't do that. You can only kill someone who's identified as a combatant. Hmm. 
So what about, yeah, because women and children, right, isn't that the first thing you want to move them out, right? But then some, you Uh know, rape, pillage, and plunder when they go into a village, you know? Right. And 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 some Americans have been bad. Mm -hmm. No, that, the Japanese. And what Mm -hmm. about on the Americans? Because I've, you know, heard some things, you know, I'm, I'm, you know, just reading and then um, also watching movies and stuff, but some Americans have been bad. But they have, um, you know, even when the wars that we have been fighting have been just and when they have been necessary, uh, you've always had you, you've always had a swath of every branch of service that has acted dishonorably. And as, mm-hmm. as a matter of fact, Lisa, I'm glad you brought that up uh, because uh, that's a good segue into a uh, little known place at a World War One cemetery called Plot E and. I'm not sure if hmm. you've heard of that place or not, but um, Plot mm-hmm. E is is a very little known plot of graves that is behind the superintendent's house at a World War One cemetery. Now, now keep in mind the cemetery is for World War One veterans, except for Plot E. Those are World War Two veterans, and uh, all of the graves that are on Plot E, which is completely hidden from view, are. Are, are, are the names of what they call the dishonored dead, and they're World War II veterans who were executed for war crimes in, in the European theater. Wow. And and uh, a lot of these men were draftees. A lot of these men uh, came from every walk of life, and they were executed mostly by hanging, although if you were executed by firing squad, uh, for various war crimes to include atrocities against the local European civilians. Um, some of the, uh, some of the inhabitants of plot E, I mean, I'll give you, I'll give you some names, Mm -hmm. uh, probably the most notorious person who is interned in plot E is the father of a young man named Emmett Till. Now, some of your listeners probably remember Emmett Till as the little African American Mm -hmm. boy who was killed down in Mississippi mm-hmm. back in 1955, mm-hmm. and that's what touched off the greater civil rights movement. Well, a little-known footnote to history is that Emmett Till's father was a man named Lewis Till, and uh, I think that Lewis Till was uh, – I think he was on his second marriage at that point. Um, but Lewis Till, to put it lightly, he had a lot of run-ins with the law, and in 1942, after – I think he got picked up for robbery – uh, the judge gave him a choice. He said, you can go to war or you can go to jail. It's up to you. Wow. So Lewis Till chose to go to war. He got drafted. He was serving in an all-black unit. And uh, it, his unit was in Italy uh, where you know, his criminal instincts, I think, got the better of him again. And he ended up killing two Italian women. Wow. So wow. Uh, they – yeah, so Louis Till was promptly picked up by the MPs. They threw him in jail, and uh, obviously his cellmate was a well-known radical named Ezra Pound. And, no uh, way. If any of your listeners know, yep, yep, he was yeah. cellmates with Ezra Pound. And later, Ezra Pound, uh, yeah, yep, the poet. Wow. No. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> uh, yeah. So Lewis Till was executed by hanging, um, but the War Department officially told his widow that he had been killed in action. And it wasn't until after Emmett Till died that the real truth about his father's story came out. And a lot of Southern journalists were trying to use that as an example of, see, the apple doesn't far too fall from the tree. So this kid deserved to die anyway. You know, I mean, oh. it, I mean, just, just horrible things that they were using with the story for their own effect. Wow. Uh, so Lewis Till, yeah. So Lewis Till, he's probably the most infamous person who was interred there. And there was another gentleman. Um, I, I'm not sure if you saw that Martin Sheen movie. It came out back in the '70s called The Execution of Private Slovak. Oh, no, sounds familiar. Huh. But I want to watch yeah. that. Love well, Martin Sheen. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think that was one of Martin Sheen's earliest films. Um, but Eddie Slovak, uh, he was a small-time criminal from Detroit, and uh, you know he, he had gotten in trouble throughout his youth, you know, and it was pretty much petty crimes that he had did. You know, I mean, like he would steal candy from a store, or you know, like he would break into a business and steal stuff. 
uh, petty crimes. He was in and out of juvenile detention a lot as a kid. And because of his criminal record, at the start of the war, he was classified as 4F. But, you know, as the need for manpower grew, uh, the War Department lifted mm. his 4F status and redesignated him 1A. They're like, okay, we don't care if you have a criminal record. You have all 10 fingers and all 10 toes. You can stand on your own two feet. Okay, congratulations. You're going overseas. So he goes through hmm. basic training, and he, he gets there really in the last few months of the war. He gets there, I think, in February of 1945, and he's there as a replacement. He's about to he, you know, he's about to join his unit on the front lines, uh, but about the, the second or third day or whatever it was that he was with his unit, uh, he got shelled by German artillery. And uh, this just scared the ever-living bejesus out of him. <laughs> uh, he was like on a shell shock high for about three days straight. And he finally just said, I, I can't do this. I can't go into combat. I'm, I'm not cut out for this, man. If I'm too scared. If you send me up against, if you send me up against the Nazis, I swear I'm going to run away. So, uh, you know, he had made up his mind that, uh, that he didn't want to do this. And he said, okay, well, if I desert or if I, you know, just refuse to mm -hmm. obey orders, then the worst they're going to do is just throw me into a military prison I've been to prison before. It's really not that bad. Uh, I'll take that over getting blown up by a German artillery shell. So, mm. uh, so you know, he um, he he uh, writes down his intentions on a note. He gives it to a cook and says, "Hey, cook, give this to the commanding officer." And uh, then Private Slovak takes off running in the other direction. Well, authorities catch up to him a few days later, and they offer him a chance. They're like, "Look, okay, we know you're a new soldier. We know you're probably shell shocked. Well, look." Everybody around here feels the same way you do. We're going to give you a chance to tear up this note and go back to your unit with a clean slate if you want to take that chance. And Slovak said, no, I've made up my mind. I'll take my court-martial. Well, they court-martialed him, and he was expecting to get uh, a lengthy sentence inside a military prison, which was par for the course for people who had deserted. Mm -hmm. But uh, desertion had become such a problem – in the European theater that once it got up to Eisenhower, he said, you know what? I need to make an example out of someone. So uh -oh. people will stop trying to run away. Whoa. So, uh, so Eisenhower approved the execution order and he was the only soldier in the European theater who was executed for a purely military offense. Everyone else wow. who deserted got jail sentences and most of them were commuted after the war ended um, but they sent Private Slovak to the firing squad, and uh, his last words, his last known words, um, were to the priest who was saying the last rites as they were tying uh, uh, as they were tying up to the post. He said, "You know, mm. he, he he said he said, hey, Eddie, God be with you." Mm. And Eddie just looked at the priest and said, "You too, Father. I hope you don't join me soon afterwards." Whoa. Mm. Yeah. I do yeah. remember Staying this story. Life. I think I did see that movie. Yeah. It sounds familiar. Mm -hmm. You know? All right. It does. So, oh. uh, so Eddie know. Slovak, yeah. he got buried in Plot E for quite a few years. I think he was there for 40 years until his widow uh, petitioned. She, she had been petitioning the government for quite a while to get his, to get his remains returned back stateside. And finally, it was President Reagan who signed off on the authorization to have Eddie Slovak, uh, to have him uh, exhumed and ha have his body shipped back to the United States, where I think he's buried in New Jersey, if I'm not mistaken. Wow. 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 We're going to have yeah. to watch for this on our tour, our Love Your Park tour. We're going to have to go so graveyard hopping, which yeah, when, we like doing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> when we were in, in um, South Africa, we what was it called Pilgrim's Rest, that mm -hmm. graveyard where if you were a C for um, – a bad person, they buried you with your feet headed opposite to how everybody else's feet were heading. So if you were... You're going mm -hmm. to hell. Yeah, if your head was was facing east and your feet would be going west, everybody else was the opposite direction. I always thought that was really a weird thing. It's, mm -hmm. it's interesting because you know, yeah. I can't remember which direction turned out to be the bad direction. <laughs> there was some weird things because they had people graves completely and like the whole thing was twisted around mm -hmm. and it was that place gave me the creeps man mm -hmm. i'll never I, it was one of those misty areas in the mm -hmm. mountains and yeah. it just that place 
And that, calling it Pilgrim's Rest, uh-uh. you know, it's just really I don't odd. ever need to go there again. There were a few places we went, and I'm like, mm-mm. You always felt like you're being watched. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. That was not cool. Man, man, you know, Military Mike, these are some crazy stories. I do want to know what Julia Child was cooking up yeah. as a spy. How did she oh, spy? Yes. Okay, so the name Julia Childs, uh, I'm sure for everyone, evokes the images of a home cooking show. You know, this, yeah. uh, I think we can trace, yeah, I, I think we can trace the lineage of HGTV and, uh, and uh, also cooking with Emerald and pretty much uh, anything, anything having to do with TV cooking all the way back to Julia Child. Uh, you know, yeah. she was, uh, yeah, uh, she was really the forebearer of every home cooking show that we know today. And, mm-hmm. She uh, and her debut cookbook was called Mastering the Art of French Cooking, and she just took it to a whole new level. You know, I mean, she had the French Chef, which premiered all the way back in 1963. So, uh, you know, despite her legacy and everything that uh, you know, everything that she has done to you know take the culinary arts to where they are today, what a lot of people don't know is that uh, she had joined the OSS, the Office of Strategic Services, during World War II. And she only did that after she had been turned down for enlistment in the Navy. You know, she, she had wanted to join the uh, – yeah, she had wanted to join an organization uh, called the Waves, which mm-hmm. was, uh, you know, w- which was the uh, – w- which, which, was, which was the U.S. Naval Reserve's Women's Corps, and mm-hmm. uh, she had also tried to enlist. Uh, she had tried to enlist in the WAX, the uh, the Women's Army Corps. Mm-hmm. So, having been turned down for both of those organizations, she offered her service to she offered her uh, services to the OSS. And what she had uh, what she had found out in the course of a lot of her cooking experiments was that she uh, had developed uh, some combination of chemicals to make a shark repellent. Whoa. A wow. shark re- yeah. Of wow. all things a shark repellent. So what she did that was you uh, that. she Yeah, stick your yeah. toe in the water so, and find yeah. out. Wow. <laughs> right. Right. So she um so uh what she did was uh, she worked as an assistant for developers of a team who were making shark repellent and uh, you know at at first one might ask you know, what would shark repellent have to do with anything that we're doing in the war? I mean, I, you know, what military yeah. purpose is there for shark repellent? And it actually turned out that this was a, a pretty big problem in the North and Mid-Atlantic because uh, sharks were attacking a lot of underwater mines and a lot of depth charges that were intended for German U-boats. Oh. You know, um, yeah, what would happen is, you would have a battleship group or you would have a cruiser or a frigate of some sort, you know, that was um, off the coast of Spain or maybe off the coast of Iceland. And they would be, and they would be dropping these depth charges, you know, to go after these German submarines. Well, if you have a school of sharks that get eyes on this depth charge that's going down, they really don't know what it is, but you know, their instincts tell them, Oh, Hey, that's food. You know, that's something that we can eat. So then you have a massacred school of great white sharks and, Oh. instead of a blown up U boat. <laughs> wow. Oh my gosh. So this yeah. was like a shark right. Oh wow. my gosh. So you have to watch, you know, the enemy and the shark. Like you know, mm-hmm. I I grew up around great white sharks in South Africa. Nets. And I I had shark friends nets. I they would jump the shark net. <laughs> exactly. I you know, you your friend would go surfing and sometimes come back with no arm or leg and you know, when a great white once there's like the sardine run that would happen, and oh, when the yeah. and the great whites mm-hmm. would come out, you they, they would go out on the sharks board in these boats and like literally club them back. There's uh uh-uh, uh heck no. I remember being out once on mm-hmm. a rubber dinghy out there, and we got circled by hammerhead sharks, and you're out there mm-hmm. and I'm like, no, <laughs> you know. <laughs> and then my friends dived in because they're all scuba divers and you know they they were you know into all that stuff and I'm like, 
but I'm on the boat. My friend and I, <laughs> both of us in there, be, we're like, we're being girls. <laughs> so scared. I mean, it's like, you know, just if they touch, you know, with their teeth, you know. But And the great whites, that's what right. scared me is like, okay, if some, you know, if they smell something, but they came in like packs, like yes. no kidding. Mm-hmm. They came in like packs after the fish jumped, or certain seasons. Yeah, the sardine runs. The, it, it, and they, they would mm-hmm. jump the, the, the nets no problem. You and I'm all stand on the down. shore and see them, and then you're like, "That's too many sharks. I'm never going swimming again." But they did. As a kid, we used to go and and <laughs> and go out and always go past where you're supposed to, just out of that. I did it, and I didn't get bitten by a shark. How crazy is that? <laughs> That's what we used to do in the beach. But anyway, I know there was that one beach known for it, and I yeah. I don't uh-huh. ask me why, but we had that. It's the same thing as kids jumping off roofs and things. Yep. Didn't you do that, Mike? Did you jump off Roller roofs and down the roof. roofs and do <laughs> that kind of thing? You know, to prepare uh, well, for going into the military. <laughs> well, uh, I guess you could call it roofs. Um, I jumped off of some. Uh, I jumped off of some pretty high parachute platforms when I was in the military. So they, wow. were, they were roofs of what would otherwise just be yeah. like a normal shed or. Probably, probably, probably a normal maintenance building. Yeah. So, are you scared of your daughters doing that kind of thing? <laughs> <Just saying. laughs> you know, like more you than you know. Be doing this. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you know, just, you will not be doing this. But uh, so, yeah. So now, Josephine Baker, I heard that she was smuggling secrets for the French. I mean, there, there's some interesting people. I know we just did a segment on the doll woman spy. You know, so women ended up doing things. And, you know, right. so, but Julia helps with this, with the shark thing, but did, I mean, that was a positive, right, for us. That wasn't anything, right. like, bad, or was it? No. No, mm. no, not at all. Okay, so she was Smart okay. lady. Yeah, she is. She's, she's cool. Now, what about um, yeah. this Virginia Hall lady? I heard that she's got a limp, like she was known as the limping lady or something. <laughs> yeah, so... The story of Virginia Hall uh, is really a fascinating one, and I think what makes it more remarkable is that you know she accomplished everything that she did uh, during a time when you know it was expected and in some places even mandatory that a woman's role was in the home and that women mm-hmm. did not seek any type of outs- outside employment. Mm-hmm. Well, mm-hmm. this lady Virginia Hall. She was a nurse by trade, but she is the only woman in history, and uh, I think probably the only person in history to get three prestigious awards from three separate governments. She was awarded the Distinguished Service Cross by the U.S. She was named a member of the British Embassy by by the U.K. and you know, and then then she also received uh, she also received the Croix de Guerre from the French government. So she got the second highest award for valor from the U.S., and then she got the highest honors from France and Britain. And wow. she did this while she was a spy um, with the with both the uh, American OSS and the British Special Operations Executive. And it, just remarkable things that she was able to accomplish. You know, she. Um, they called her the limping lady because, uh, you know, actually she had an artificial leg. So here she is doing all of this, uh, all of this great spy work while she's wearing a prosthetic. And, uh, you know, they wanted, she had wanted to parachute behind enemy lines, but they said, well, no, because of your prosthetic leg, we can't risk that. So what we'll do is we'll just put you in a landing craft ashore. And, uh, under her code name, her code name was Diane. And, uh, she, she, she eluded German forces. She eluded the Gestapo and made contact with the French resistance in France. And she mapped out drop zones for supplies and commandos from Great Britain. And she also, she also, she also had a network of safe houses set up and she linked up with the Jagbird teams uh, that landed after the Normandy invasion. You know, she, uh, she helped train three whole battalions of the three whole battalions of French resistance uh, forces to wage wow. guerrilla warfare against the Germans. And, uh, yeah, she lived to tell about the tale. Uh, in 1950, she actually married one of her fellow OSS agents, and uh, she she uh, hung in there for quite a while. She she died in 1982, 
at the age of 76. Mm-hmm. But uh, wow. yeah, her her legacy l- l- lives on as uh, one tough cookie. <laughs> wow. You know, and that's Josephine Baker. That's what she was doing. She was working with the French Resistance mm-hmm. too. You know, but I've heard that Julia Child, going back to her, that she moved papers around. Like she she handled some special papers. And, um, you know, so that she touched a little bit, but she wasn't like a spy spy. It's not like, you know, some of the other ones. No, Sterling Hayden, who's that? Let's see, Sterling Hayden. Now, Sterling Hayden, he was, uh, well, he was not only a uh, OSS operative, but, uh, you know, he was, um, he was also a Hollywood actor. Yeah. Oh, that's right. Um, mm-hmm. you, 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 you probably remember uh, Sterling Hayden. His uh, his most memorable role, I think, was uh, uh, was as General Jack Ripper in the oh. old movie Doctor Strangelove. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. So yeah. he was in that. Um, yeah. He he also had roles in Asphalt Jungle, and uh, he was in one of Stanley Kubrick's earliest films, The Killing. Yeah. Mm. Man. And he ended up yeah. with this wild, yeah. crazy beard, man. Yeah. <laughs> mm-hmm. Him, yeah. I yeah. mean, it's so it's interesting because there's like these celebrities, right? There's, you know, Roald Dahl, uh-huh. the the uh, writer, uh, Morris Moberg. I'm just looking at this list online here. Graham Greene, the novelist. So it seems that there's these creative people and these celebrity icons, Julia Child, the chef, you know. Um, mm-hmm. It just is interesting to me how they were all part of it, but – you know, when you think about World War II, weren't we all part of it? If we were here and of age, everybody did something somewhere, even if it wasn't right. the right thing to do. There was, you know, some mm-hmm. naughty things. But um, And Arthur Goldberg, he was part of this too. So it's kind of interesting that with all of these people doing things, um, yeah, that it's these celebrities that are in there doing it because you don't think that you just go oh mm-hmm. look there's a nice movie what a great well, book certainly they entertain troops mm-hmm. you know great poetry right. things you know mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah exactly uh, but so was he did he spy or what did Sterling Hayden do? Well, uh, he had actually just started off in Hollywood when the war broke out, and he had been in two films I think at this point, and then after Pearl Harbor. He at first he listed in the army, and uh, then he then he deployed to England. But uh, he broke his ankle while 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 he was in Britain, and because of the severity of the injury, they ended up medically discharging him from the army. But when he returned to the U.S., he wasn't daunted at all. He said, "Okay, well, if the army kicked me out, let me try the Marine Corps, and I'll just stay hush hush about my erstwhile ankle injury." Mm. So he ended up joining the Marine Corps as a private, and uh, while he was undergoing boot camp at Paris Island, he uh, he actually was uh, accepted into officer candidate school. So he was accepted as a second lieutenant in the Marine Corps, and then he uh, transferred to uh, he, he he transferred to the OSS where he started training under Wild Bill Donovan. And while he was an OSS agent, uh, he, he, he took up a pseudonym, um, and oddly enough, a lot of his records actually appear under his, pseudo, his pseudonym, which was John Hamilton. And uh, what he would do is he would use his uh, experience sailing boats, and he would take these schooners, and he would sail supplies from Italy to the Yugoslavian partisans you know, who were fighting the Nazis in the Balkans. Wow. Wow, and then so he was working with um, Wild Bill, right? William Donovan, and yep. so mm-hmm. Wild Bill was above him, right? Yeah, okay. and uh, he apparently was uh, such an enormous help to the Yugoslavian partisans that Marshal Tito himself actually commended Hayden for uh, he commended Hayden for his bravery. And uh, he uh, he's one of the few Americans, I think, if not the only American, who was ever awarded the Yugoslavian Order of Merit. Wow. So cool. this is why everyone's getting connected, because everybody did. They united against what mm-hmm. was going on. Yeah. And so William Donovan, Wild Bill, so this is, you know, after Wild Bill Hickok, right? <laughs> I'm just saying. Yeah. We've got a lot of Wild Bills running around. Who was he? What was he up to? 
Okay. Well, William Joseph Donovan, uh, otherwise known by his nom de guerre, which is Wild Bill, uh, uh, just an incredible man, had, had accomplished so much. I mean, he was a lawyer. He was a diplomat. He was an intelligence officer. Uh, he had accomplished uh, so much in his early life, and and he he had also fought in World War One. And who came around? Mm-hmm. That's when uh, you know. That's when uh, that's when he was assigned by President Roosevelt, no less, to be the director of the. Uh, of the Office of Information, and Donovan's mm. title was Coordinator of Information. And, you know, the, the U.S. government really didn't have a formal spy agency at this point, so Bill Donovan was really the mm. guy who was, you know, piecing together uh, the framework of what would eventually become the CIA. And, uh, you know, there was so much overlap between the OSS and the U.S. military because a lot of the OSS personnel were – pretty much on loan from the military. And, uh, you know, there was military personnel that uh, populated most of its ranks, but, uh, you know, coordinating all, coordinating all of the paramilitary activities, coordinating all of the, uh, all of the surveillance and spy missions, all of that was coming out of the OSS. And uh, it was, it was really Bill Donovan who was, you know, creating the framework as he went along. Wow. I had no idea. And then you had the CIA and then later, we had Jack Bauer on Twenty Four. <laughs> yeah. I like, I like Twenty Four back when it was on. That was oh, good. Yeah. That was good, especially was the beginning show. part of it. Yeah, Jack yeah. Bauer. Mm-hmm. He always had that, you know, little bag. But he he could jump off of buildings. He was like he jumped off a ton of buildings. He was like the MacGyver of the CIA, he did right? That jump, roll, uh-huh. and stand up and run again. Yeah, and and listen, <laughs> can't we just keep MacGyver where MacGyver was, like back in the day? Why do we have to recreate it? You know, MacGyver <laughs> right. was MacGyver. I'm sorry. I have a thing about those shows, the old, you know, the A-Team, MacGyver, mm-hmm. you know. Mm-hmm. Kit, I need you. Oh, no. <laughs> What's that? What was that? That's Knight Rider. Knight Rider, David sorry. Okay, I've gone off on a tangent. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> That's not a good one. No, no, but the A-Team were cool. They were cool. Come on, Mr. T. Yeah, he was cool. Come on. Yeah. Did you ever watch any of those shows, Mike? Oh, of course. Okay, I knew you had to. Come on, Mr. Yeah. T. Yeah. yeah. He was yeah. like, he was cool. I'd, yeah. I'd go to a war with, with him. Knight Rider, I mean, David no, no, Knight Rider is lame. Standing in, no. and knocking like the down car. the walls. <laughs> no, I like the car. I like the car. Kit, Kit was cool. Yeah, Kit was cool. Okay, well, I'm gonna get us back on track here. Sorry, you know, this is this is how I would fight a war. I'd get Mr. T, <laughs> see if he would fit in Knight Rider. But they had that van. Remember that van? When they drive around yeah. the A team, had mm-hmm. their own van, right? And I'd have MacGyver. Okay, so last one is Art Schlesinger. So tell us about him. What, do we, what did he do? Okay. Well, uh, the name Art Schlesinger, uh, for most folks, I think, um, probably probably evokes the image of a historian. Uh, you know, mm-hmm. he, um, he was a Pulitzer Prize winner. Uh, as a matter of fact, I think he was the youngest person in history to win a Pulitzer, um, won that back in the late forties. And, uh, you know, he did, uh, he, he's done a number of spectacular biographies on people's p- people such as FDR. Uh, he did one on mm-hmm. JFK. He did one on Bobby Kennedy. Uh, you know, he's, uh, he's, he's really a heavyweight in the historical scholarly community. Um, but mm-hmm. what I think fewer people know is uh, that he also did his time in the OSS. So he uh, he had wanted to be in the army, and he uh, he of course tried to enlist. Turns out that he failed his military medical examination, uh, oh. which was pretty thorough. And uh, they said, "I'm sorry, but uh, you're not qualified to be in the military based on these items that we see." So instead, he said, okay, well, if I can't join the military proper, I'll do something else that I know is going to be of equal importance to our national security and equally important to winning this war. So that's when he joins what is originally the Office of War Information, which eventually becomes the OSS. And in that regard, Schlesinger was an analyst. Now, wasn't a uh, spy on the front lines per se, but what he would do is he would interpret 
the raw data oh. that the spies were sending back and oh. synthesize it into a coherent into a coherent narrative for all of our policymakers to make decisions on. And uh, you know, that's uh you can see that having a historian and having an author like Arthur Schlesinger is probably the best man to have for that job since, you know, he can, wow. if he can knock out, you know, these epic tomes of literature in 90 days or less, just imagine what he can do inside of two yeah. weeks with a bunch of intelligence reports. Yeah. Man. How cool. So now we have CSI. Yeah. He's got, <laughs> he's got all the yeah. secrets. Cool. That is so uh-huh. cool. That's what I find so interesting is, you know, reading code and, and all of that, you know, and, and uh, it just, how it's changed over the years, but yet you're still, whoever's doing the code, you're still dealing with human beings doing something, so yep. you can still kind of go back to what humans do, right? Even though the people writing yeah. the code are trying to thwart that, there's still, mm-hmm. you know, there's like, there's a vibe to things. Don't mm-hmm. you, don't, doesn't gut instinct play on things like that, of understanding oh, of code and, and knowing when to do something? Is that if gut you know, feeling? Who you know who it came from? Yeah, and you, and you know that culture, or you know you know that, for example, somebody in Germany is going to do something different than mm-hmm. someone in Japan. Mm-hmm. Wow, and think differently, mm-hmm. but it's still humans. Humans, yeah. But those that bayonet thing's going to stick with me, man. No, I don't like that. Literally, that's just still <laughs> freaking me out. No, it's freaking. I thought the bamboo under mm-hmm. the fingernails was bad, but I didn't know about the bayonet thing. Thanks for that imagery, yeah. Mike. Oh, no. <laughs> That's going to wake me oh, okay. up at 2 in the morning, and I'm going to go, my eyes, my eyes. <laughs> you know? uh-huh. Wow. Yeah. You know, well, well, you know, an interesting footnote to that is that, um, is that in the early days of the Manchurian campaign, um, mm-hmm. when, when, when the Imperial Japanese Army was, uh, was plowing through northern China, um, you know, they were doing unspeakably cruel acts to the Chinese citizens there. And what's interesting is that uh, a lot of the frontline forces had Nazi liaisons with them. You know, but they were officers from Germany, and uh, they had been – They had been sent to China, you, you, you know, to act as liaisons and, you know, pretty much act as advisors to the Japanese. And at one point, mm. when the Japanese were invading Nanking, they were apparently being so brutal and so hostile to the local citizens that one of the Nazi officers came running up to them and said, stop, stop, this is too much, you're being too brutal. And I thought about that, and I'm thinking to myself, mm. if you have a Nazi, of all people, telling you you're yeah. being too brutal, you know you done wow. screwed up real bad. Yeah, really. That's messed up, man. That's some that's crazy. crazy. Yeah. That's That's crazy. Man. Oh my God. Yeah. So I hear you from a little Tweety Bird, which is the true Tweety Bird out there, because you do great tweets all the time, um, uh-huh. that there's another book coming out. Yes. Cool. Cool. Tell, tell. Can you yeah. tell? Okay. Well, absolutely. As a matter of fact, uh, as a matter of fact, there are two on the horizon for this fall. Um, yeah. The uh, the first one. Is called. Uh, let's see. The first one is called American Armor in the Pacific, and mm-hmm. that is a um, uh, that is part of a uh, new series that has been launched by Casemate Publishers called the Casemate mm-hmm. Illustrated Series, and uh, that is um, uh, that is. Uh, an illustrated series that just takes any particular point in point in military history and tells it through a very strong photographic element. Uh, so mm. what my installment is, is a, um, is uh, an illustrated review of the American tank battles that happened in the Pacific of world war II. Wow. And You're back then, to the tank. yeah. And you, then you are the tank right. man. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, and then then the second book is called Tomcat Fury, and uh, that is a combat history of the F-14. Oh, wow. So, everybody, this is coming out fall, so keep up with Mike at MikeGuardia.com. 
and uh, keep listening to him on Big Blend Radio. You can go to Blend Radio and TV.com, see him in our expert department. He's also, uh, if you go into uh, nationalparktraveling.com, just type in Mission Possible or type in Military Mike. <laughs> you know, you'll find our stories that we're doing as we travel the country and then we connect with Military Mike and say, hey, you know, we found this general story or we're trying to follow in the footsteps of Hal Moore, uh, also Russell Volkman, and Donald D. Blackburn, and uh, to just go where they've been in America. Mm-hmm. So um, I surely do not want to go back in time where they were because some of those places sound brutal and scary. <laughs> so we really appreciate what they have done in, for our, our lives here. Uh, but again, MikeGuardia.com, he's on Twitter and Facebook as well. Keep up with him there. Uh, you always put up all these photo series. I always learn from you uh, whenever you post things. I'm like, oh, look, I didn't know they rode bicycles. <laughs> I didn't know this. <laughs> you know. So I'm always learning history through you. So thank you so much for joining us, Mike. All righty. Well, thank you for having me on the show. It is a pleasure, as always. As always. Oh, and fine. we have a song for you. We always like to play music for our guests. This song is called Fortune okay. Favors. Fortune Favors the Brave. That's right. uh, this is from our friends, the Walkabout Band, uh, with their part New York and part Australian. See, and we covered Australia today, so this makes <laughs> sense. <laughs> so everyone, uh, this is off of their uh, first album titled Walkabout Band, and uh, here it is, Fortune Favors the Brave. You can keep up with them at walkaboutband.com. Thanks, Captain, I was gonna, Captain Mike, Military Mike. Here it is, Fortune Favors the Brave. Thank you. 